Okay. Then okay. we move on okay. to the next talk. Um, Dr. Peter van Hogefest uh, from Lipoid uh, GmbH in Ludwigshafen is going to talk about the quality requirements for phospholipid excipients in liposomal formulations. Thank you very much, Ben, for this introduction. And I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to give this uh, seminar. Um, oh, is this? Thank you. On the quality requirements uh, for phospholipids excipients in liposomal formulations, this is addressing the issue which has not been discussed before, namely that uh, components of dosage forms also must have a uh, controlled quality. So you have seen a lot of examples of uh, what sort of requirements are needed to release liposomal dosage forms, but uh, the components of these liposomal dosage forms need also have some uh, quality and that I will discuss in the seminar. It also serves as an example for other nanomaterials will have the same problem that if you want to induce uh, new nanomaterials, you're also forced to give some uh, quality to these uh, materials in order to get this uh, accepted by regulatory authorities for clinical trials. So the Phospholipid molecules, probably you know this, of course, but for, for the people who are not aware of it, uh, any lipid which contains phospholy uh, phosphorus are called uh, phospholipids. They are constructed out of a molecule uh, comprised of uh, glycerol, to which two fatty acids are esterified, and the third uh, hydroxyl group of glycerol is then esterified to a phosphate, and this is on its turn esterified with an alcohol. So dependent on the identity of the alcohol, you can have phosphodetylcholine uh, with the head group choline, or phosphodetylethanolamine with the head group ethanolamine, etc. So you have also phosphodetylserine and phosphodetylinositol. Natural phospholipids, uh, so phospholipids isolated from natural sources, they have uh, mainly uh, unsaturated fatty acids in the second position and in the first position saturated phospholipids. So they are heterogeneous in that respect and also with respect to quality is important to know which hydroxyl group is bound to which uh, fatty acid. <clears throat> Synthetic phospholipids, of course, you can make uh, your own choice what sort of position a certain fatty acid should have at, uh, at uh, the, uh, the first or the second hydroxyl group of, uh, hydro, uh, of glycerol. So phospholipids are uh, very um, physiological excipients and that makes them very attractive to use them in, in drug delivery because they have an intrinsic uh, biocompatibility and biodegradability compared to a lot of other nanomaterials. Uh, so the, their main function is, of course, that they are uh, building blocks of uh, natural membranes. So any any cell membrane uh, is is comprising a double layer of uh, phospholipid molecules. So you find all sort of uh, phospholipid species in these membranes, like PC, PE, PI, PSPA, sphingomyelin, and cardiolipin. So all these these. Uh, uh, phospholipids you could consider to use as excipients and dosage forms as well, especially as part of, uh, for instance, liposomal dosage forms. They have, beside that, also other uh, functions like signal transduction and in response to both external and an internal stimuli and providing preferences for signal signaling processes and they also play a role in enhancing the oral absorption of uh, fatty components. They're also an essential component of bile, so they play a role in absorption uh, processes. And they're involved, of course, a part of lipoproteins and transport of fat from gut to liver, and they also connect as uh, lung surfactant. So this is illustrating the physiological importance of uh, uh, phospholipid molecules for these last functions uh, do not play such a role 
in pharmaceutical science, but they play certainly a role in uh, uh, dietetics, for instance, that uh, phospholipids could also act as a source of uh, especially natural phospholipids as essential fatty acids like omega-3 and omega-6 uh, fatty acids. Phospholipids are not only used for, uh, for liposomes, you may get the impression because people are only talking about liposomes in this uh, symposium, but uh, phospholipids are also used for other intravenous uh, dosage forms like uh, emulsions and also mixed micelles, that's a uh, composition of, uh, of glycocolic acids or bile acid and, and lecithin which is used uh, uh, to solubilize uh, drugs, and this was an invention made by uh, Hoffman La Roche uh, some, some 20 years ago. And of course, we have then here uh, the main uh, topic of today, and also of the symposium, or one of the examples of nanocarriers, which are the, the liposomes. Um, the, the phospholipid excipients are uh, really established uh, for. Uh, for intravenous use to make nanocarriers based on these products which exist for at least 15 years. So Gessie Barnold is always talking about Doxil, but you have also many other intravenous interesting products like Ambisome and Downoxome, which are also uh, pretty old. And in my opinion, that's why uh, phospholipids should be, or liposomes, uh, to be more specific, should be considered as a common standard and to compare that with uh, other nanocarriers. Uh, they have proven to increase the therapeutic index of, uh, of encapsulated drugs. They, can, they have stable and reproducible properties, otherwise regulatory authorities wouldn't accept them as a product. Uh, the, the production is also economically viable, uh, so the price of this, this sort of pro uh, product should also be in relation to the development and production costs, which has been proven by many products. And last but not least, they have been completely accepted by regulatory authorities. In these products, uh, you'll find any type of uh, phospholipids, I mean uh, from natural sources or synthetic phospholipids, and um, also uh, modified natural phospholipids, like uh, phospholipids which have uh, hydrogenated fatty acids or that the polar head group had been changed by means of phospholipase D treatment, so that you, for instance, can convert uh, AGPC to AGPG by means of the action of phospholipase uh, D. Um, okay. So from regulatory perspective, uh, you find very surprising statements uh, even made by the World Health Organization. I mean, the oral use is for this symposium less of interest, but it just uh, indicates how uh, the, the, the low toxic the compounds are. But uh, with respect to the statement of parental use, they, the WHO simply claims that uh, uh, phospholipids are non-toxic. And if you take products like intralipid, these are uh, emulsions for parental nutrition, which are administered in uh, enormous amounts uh, per, per day, you could get up uh, to 12 gram of lecithin easily administered per day. So from guidance documentation, already mentioned by Gert Storm, uh, I actually would refer to this, this document, which is this guidance, uh, which is still in the draft stage since August 20, uh, 2002, which you can use as example, as guidance to what sort of quality phospholipids you'd have. And this guidance draws the conclusion that phospholipids and nanomaterials, I think nanomaterial excipients are such important for the performance of the, of the drug product itself that the excipients should have a, the same quality requirements as the drug substance. So this requires a lot of uh, quality control and a lot of GMP conditions to manufacture these excipients. So it means that the quality of liposomes uh, is equal to the quality of the phospholipids. So in addition to these, these drug substance guidelines, they have described in these guidelines, so this guidance, uh, info recommendations, description, characterization, and manufacturer specification stability. 
So for synthetic uh, lipids, they want to have an, an evidence of the, the structure. So we have to prove that by NMR spectroscopic techniques. And for natural uh, lipids, especially the lipid composition, so we suspect the PC, PE, PS, and so on, is of importance. For the manufacture of the synthetic lipids, you have to define the source. So where it is, uh, which sort of materials do you use to synthesize the materials? For natural lipids, it's also the source. From, from if you isolate from NX, you have to show uh, from which farms they're actually coming, whether the farms are also controlled with respect to feeding the hen, so that you have reproducible phospholipid and fatty acid composition in these egg yolks. Also, the, for synthetic lipids, the uh, synthesis process, extraction and purification procedures have to be described and also the starting materials and raw materials you use for all these processes have to be described in detail. <clears throat> in the manufacture, first of all, you need in process control, chromatographic purification procedures have to be described in detail. So for synthetic lipids, the positioning of these two fatty acids is uh, you have to prove and uh, so if you use uh, natural phospholipid, you also have to prove that you have removed proteins which could cause allergies and viruses, to co of course, to cause viral infections. Last but not least, everything has to be produced under GMP. Uh, the specifications, uh, basically, as you should meet uh, test procedures. They should be validated. You must have reference standards. You must have all analytical procedures validated. You also, as described previously, as the preceding seminar, you need stability indicating not only for the drug substance, but also for these crucial excipients. Also, the impurities, just like with drug substances, need to be uh, identified and, and quantified. So, synthetic lipids need to be checked with content with TLC or HPLC. Also, the fatty acid uh, composition has to be uh, proven. And uh, also for sterile production, it's very important that you control the microbial level and the endotoxin level. And also for toxicity reasons, uh, the heavy metals have to be checked and solvent residue as well. So for stability, it's also the same as for drug substance. I'll skip that. And finally come to the conclusion, to stay within the 10 minutes. Uh, uh, that excipients uh, for liposomes and other nanocarriers determining their efficacy are considered by regulatory authorities as crucial excipients. So the quality control, manufacturing, etc., should have this level. So if you intend to develop another nanocarrier uh, other than liposomes, you have to take that very seriously and invest time in your nanomaterial to characterize that properly and to that you will reach at least the same level as, as phospholipids are being tested. So natural and synthetic phospholipids can both be used in liposomal dose form. That's also an, an important conclusion. Both have a long track uh, record of, of, uh, of safety and meeting these regulatory requirements. So that's basically the, what I wanted to say. And the message is uh, add quality to your material, and then you will satisfy uh, the need of, uh, of the requirements of regulatory authorities. But uh, Lipoid also took many, many years to come there. So be prepared that you have to invest quite a, a lot of efforts in these, uh, this quality, uh, and these quality requirements. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Yeah, the first question, Carsten. Um, Peter, I have a question regarding the pediatric acceptability. I mean, um, we are lacking also to have sufficient information to on toxicity of surfactants and uh, so excipients that uh, um, solubilize drugs. Could you comment on this? Uh, mainly probably parenteral, but probably also for oral use, don't know? Yeah, actually, there are indeed uh, products like Ambizone, for instance, uh, the, which are all, is also allowed for uh, pediatric use. Uh, you also have to look what sort of age the kids uh, may may have, or the, but it's still uh, allowed. Uh, but uh, phospholipids are, in this respect, uh, represented in, in a lot of products which are 
uh, allowed for pediatric use. So in comparison to other detergents, they are indeed uh, more accepted in general. Is there another KY? Um, may I ask how to control the endotoxin level in lipoid uh, manufacturer per size? Well, that is a matter of um, uh, starting materials and, and uh, filtration procedures. And yeah, I mean, that is uh, by ultra filtration, you can remove basically all the, the endotoxins which you could add to, to your isolation process. Huh? So natural phospholipids are mainly purified by means of uh, ethanol extraction or chrom chromatography procedures in, in solvents. And these solvers are not very good for, uh, for endotoxins, but basically you should use chemicals which are also endotoxin-free or at least controlled in that respect. I mean, at the end of the day, the produced phospholipids should not be endotoxin-free, but they should have such a low level that it would allow a certain doses per hour dependent on your clinical setting. Uh, so it should not be endotoxin-free, but controlled. And this you can do by controlling the level of all your, your, your chemicals you use and, and your, your procedures. Okay. Any other questions? This is not the case. Uh, then I would like to close the session. So we reviewed um, of the typical pharmaceutical needs on a high level uh, that you hit when going to first human dose and it's different from both from a performance perspective as well as from quality control perspective which route is being taken. Um, we have now a break uh, for a quarter of an hour and of course the breaks are also an opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one discussions. So I wish you a nice evening. <laughs>